Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today, we will be continuing our quest to figure out whether George's version of Daenerys will be as loco as the show's. In our last few videos, we followed Danny from Astapor to Yunkai, where she quickly proved herself to be a natural battle commander and strategist when she outwitted the leaders of both cities in two nearly perfect victories and was, for lack of a better way of saying it, kicking ass and taking names. Today's video will complete her storyline in A Storm of Swords and her conquest of Slaver's Bay, where we see her contend with the formidable walls of Marine, survive an assassination attempt, grapple with personal betrayal, and wrestle with the question of what to do now that her conquest was complete. So, let's do this. Danny's fifth A Storm of Swords chapter begins outside Marine, which is a far more formidable city than Astapor or Yunkai, with high, well-maintained walls and towers strategically placed that will make taking it by force extremely difficult. Soon after their arrival, the Marinese sent out a champion to settle matters in single combat. Her blood riders each ask for the honor of fighting him for her, but Danny says no because they're too valuable to risk. Jorah tells her to ignore the champion, and as always, Arston disagrees. He thinks that the champion should be met, and soon, because every minute they allow him to taunt them, the spirits of the soldiers defending the city are raised ever higher. Danny, who already has a lot on her mind, basically tells both of them to shut up and let her think. The Marinese had burned all their crops and livestock that they couldn't carry back to the city, and poisoned every well which is a pretty serious problem because of the number of freed slaves that have followed her to Marine. Her host is now over 80,000, and there's no food or drinkable water. Jorah and her blood riders wanted her to forbid them from coming, but Danny didn't see how she could tell people that she'd just freed, that they weren't free to follow her. And if that wasn't bad enough, the Marinese had crucified 163 children, using them as mile markers and as some sort of cruel message to Danny's approaching host. As you might expect, Danny was neither impressed or pleased with what they did, and it steeled her resolve in that regardless of how difficult it will be to take this city, Marine will not escape justice. But first, she needs to silence this champion of theirs, who was now literally pissing in her general direction, prompting the men guarding the walls of the city to do the same. She decided that Belois was the man for the job. He leads no troops, and, as a former pit-fighting slave of Marine, if he were to lose, it would make the champion's victory hollow. But if he wins, it would shame the Marinese that their great champion was defeated by a slave. And as an added bonus, she'd get to see how good of a protector Illyrio had sent her. As is Belois's custom, he allowed the champion to cut him once, before disposing of him as easily as the mountain would kill Tyrion. Remembering that she lost Drogo to a similar wound, Danny insisted that Belwis's wound be treated, and after borderline shaming him into obliging, she invited her officers to her pavilion to discuss how best to take the city. Jorah thinks they'd be better off leaving Marine untouched and marching on to Pentos. He reminded her that she came to Slaver's Bay for an army, not a war, and that her war is in Westeros, and she can't free every slave. But Danny remembered the 163 crucified children the Miranese used as mile markers and is not willing to do so. She says that in spite of its strong appearance, Mirin must have a weakness or a way in. Brown Ben Plum the newly elected captain of the Second Sons tells her that he once escaped from Marine through the sewers, 
and that it might be possible to send a few men in the way he came out. Not him, though. Once was enough for him. Danny doesn't particularly like that option, and dismisses her officers so she can consider her options. After acting her age for a minute and daydreaming about hot Dario, she chastises herself and decides she needed some fresh air. She wants to feel the wind on her face and smell the salty sea air. She tells Missande to saddle both her silver and her horse and summon Arston so she can ride down to the shore. As she rides the coastline, she first encounters the Unsullied's camp, which is as orderly as a camp could be, before entering the Freedmen's camp, which was quite the opposite. Once she arrives in the Freedmen's camp, she is instantly surrounded by men, women, and children, all wanting to thank her, be blessed by her, or touch her for good luck. Everything is fine, until someone grabbed her and yanked her from her saddle. When she hit the ground, she saw the man had a sword in his hand. It was Miro, the Titan's bastard, and he wants revenge. Arston steps between the two with his wooden staff, and it wasn't even a fight. Miro has a reputation for being a dangerous man, and Arston shattered a few of his ribs, as well as his jaw, leg, and skull by the time Danny got back to her feet. Arston is a straight-up bamf. A short time after they got back to her pavilion, Jorah arrives to report on the state of the walls of Marine, but was interrupted by Danny telling him that Miro tried to kill her and that he owed the reward he had offered for Miro to Arston, who disposed of him with a stick. At this point, Jorah finally can't take it anymore, and asked Arston who he is, because killing a man of the likes of Miro, when Miro had a sword and he only had a stick, is no easy task. Arston replies, A better knight than you, and goes on to begin telling Danny the truth about who he is. It was only after hearing about 70% of Arston's life story that Jorah finally figured out that he's Barristan Selmy. So, after months of being with Arston every single day and admitting that he's seen him at least a dozen times before, it took hearing 70% of his life story for Jorah to figure out who Arston is. And he was living in close quarters with him, actively trying to figure out who he was every single day for the past few months. And this wasn't even the first time that Barristan pulled this off. When he escaped King's Landing after Joffrey tried to have him killed, he changed his clothes and walked right back into the city and past the gold cloaks that were literally looking for him at the time, and no one knew who he was. The same thing happened when Jamie returned to King's Landing. No one recognized him. The concept is almost alien to us, but in George's world, famous people are not easily recognized, be they Barristan Selmy, Jamie, or even Arthur Dane, even to someone that's seen them a dozen times before. Jorah, who's wanted Arston out of Danny's inner circle since the moment they met, thought that this was his big chance to get rid of him, and acted without considering the fact that Barristan was on Robert's small council and would therefore know that he was the informer that was feeding Varys information about Danny since the day he met her. Barristan threw that and the fact that Jorah fought against Rhaegar the Trident in his face. Danny was a little overwhelmed and upset by all the truths flying her way, and ordered them to leave. When they asked where they should go, she immediately thought of a suitable place for sewer rats such as them. Danny's sixth and final chapter of A Storm of Swords, and 21st overall, begins inside the walls of Marine, after her conquest of the city, with Danny breaking her fast on the terrace atop the Great Pyramid, which she's taken as her seat in Marine. She thinks to herself how she's grown very fond of Missande, and promises to one day take her wise little scribe back home to Nath. The sweetness of the morning is turned sour when she is reminded of the infestation of flies plaguing the city after the bloody slave uprising her sewer rats led that paved the way to her conquest of Marine. With the help of her handmaids, Danny takes a bath and gets ready to hold court. 
When she was all done up, Masande brings her a looking glass so she might behold their hard work. And when she looks at herself, she wonders if she's looking at the face of a conqueror. All she sees is a little girl. She then has the following thoughts. No one is calling her Daenerys the Conqueror yet, but perhaps they would. Aegon the Conqueror had won Westeros with three dragons, but she had taken Marine with sewer rats and a wooden cock in less than a day. Poor Grolio. He still grieved for a ship, she knew. If a war galley could ram another ship, why not a gate? That had been her thought when she commanded the captains to drive their ships ashore. Their masts had become her battering rams, and swarms of freedmen had torn their hulls apart to build mantlets, turtles, catapults, and ladders. The sellswords had given each ram a body name, and it had been the main mast of Meraxes, formerly Jozo's prank, that had broken the eastern gate. Jozo's cock, they called it. The fighting had raged bitter and bloody for most of a day, and well into the night, before the wood began to splinter, and Meraxes' iron figurehead, a laughing jester's face, came crashing through. Danny had wanted to lead the attack herself, but to a man, her captain said that would be madness, and her captains never agreed on anything. Instead, she remained in the rear, sitting atop her silver in a long shirt of mail. She heard the city fall from half a league away, though, when the defenders' shouts of defiance changed to cries of fear. Her dragons had roared as one in that moment, filling the night with flame. The slaves are rising, she knew at once. My sewer rats have gnawed off their chains. When the last resistance had been crushed by the Unsullied, and the sack had run its course, Danny entered her city. The dead were heaped so high before the broken gate that it took her freedmen near an hour to make a path for her silver. Jozo's cock and the great wooden turtle that had protected it, covered with horse hides, lay abandoned within. She rode past burned buildings and broken windows through brick streets where the gutters were choked with the stiff and swollen dead. Cheering slaves lifted blood-stained hands to her as she went by and called her Mother. In the plaza before the Great Pyramid, the Miranese huddled forlorn. The great masters had looked anything but great in the morning light. Stripped of their jewels and their fringed tokars, they were contemptible. A herd of old men with shriveled balls and spotted skin, and young men with ridiculous hair. Their women were either soft and fleshy or dry as old sticks, their face paint streaked by tears. I want your leaders, Danny told them. Give them up, and the rest of you shall be spared. How many? one old woman had asked, sobbing. How many must you have to spare us? One hundred and sixty-three, she answered. She had them nailed to wooden posts around the plaza, each man pointing at the next. The anger was fierce and hot inside her when she gave the command. It made her feel like an avenging dragon. But later, when she passed the men dying on the posts, and she heard their moans and smelled their bowels and blood. Danny put the glass aside, frowning. It was just. It was. I did it for the children. Okay, so this sequence is important for understanding Danny's character for multiple reasons. The first is that it shows us just how good Danny is at drawing up successful battle plans, even though no one ever taught her to do it. The second reason that this is really important is that it speaks to the type of person that Danny is. It's a scene that a lot of people point to and say that it foreshadows a dark turn for her character. But if you take a close look at her inner monologue regarding what she did, it seems to be the exact opposite. 
Now, we already said what the Miranese did to these 163 children, so we don't really need to get into that. And since we're talking about it, it seems relevant to bring up that in the show, they had Hisdar assert that his father was one of many great masters that spoke against crucifying the children, which transformed Danny's act into one of unjust cruelty. There were no such claims made by any of the noble families of Marine in George's version of events. What Danny did in the books was brutal, but it wasn't unjust. And the most important aspect of the scene is that she seems to sort of regret what she did. When she thinks back on it, she admits that the anger she felt towards the men who crucified 163 innocent children fueled her actions, and that it felt like the right thing to do at the time. But when she looked at it afterwards, she felt differently. The men she crucified were brutal slavers and overall shitty human beings, and she feels a little bad about serving them a dish of poetic justice. Now let's apply her feelings towards this to her actions in the Bells episode of Season 8. If executing 163 scumbags that crucified innocent children and used them as mile markers makes her feel uncomfortable and maybe even a little disappointed in herself, how do you think she'd feel about killing a million innocent civilians? One thing seemed sure. She wouldn't be proud of herself and go out and proclaim her intent to put on repeat performances all over the world. And before we move too far forward from this, I'm guessing that a lot of you still disagree that what Danny did here was justice. To that, I'd ask you what Ned would have done. I find it difficult to imagine that Ned would have done any less than take 163 heads. Granted, Danny's form of justice has a little more of an eye for an eye, a cross for a cross feel to it, but it's still justice. This is one of those rare instances where justice sort of flirts on the edge of being vengeance. But since Danny was really the only one that seemed to care about the children, it was going to be difficult to separate the two no matter what. Doing what she did made Danny feel better for a minute. But when the moment passed, she didn't like it. Like George said, Danny is learning as she goes, and her willingness to acknowledge her mistakes is a good thing. In this case, Danny made a decision in anger at a moment when she had no close advisors to turn to for help, and is now learning the lesson that Ned taught Bran in the first chapter of the series from experience in self-reflection rather than having the luxury of being told. This is an aspect of her character that we'll be circling back to towards the end of the video, so keep this in mind. Dealing with all this in the immediate wake of Jorah's betrayal has Danny feeling very alone as she takes her seat in the Great Hall to hold court. She looks over those that are still with her and wonders who she can trust and who will betray her next. Then, she thinks about the three heads of the dragon prophecy, and how, according to Jorah, there must be two men out there somewhere that she can trust. And when she finds them, it'll be them against the world, like Aegon and his sisters. Now it was time for her to get down to business. Following the slave uprising and subsequent sack of marine that paved the way to her conquest, Danny acted quickly to restore order in the city that was now hers. The newly freed pit-fighting slaves were wreaking havoc on the city, so Danny ordered that rapists were to be gelded, murderers put to death, and thieves were to lose their hand. After sending her unsullied around the city to make sure that everyone knew she was serious about enforcing these new laws, things have finally begun to settle down. When a fly buzzed past her head, she's reminded that they're a problem that must be dealt with immediately. Brown Ben tells her that it's the dead bodies that are the cause, prompting Dario to remind her that the 163 masters she executed upon taking the city are to blame as well. This brings her to her second period of reflection on her decision to crucify the 163 masters, and might even be as revealing as the first. In this little inner monologue, she compares what she did to the horrors she witnessed in Astapor's Plaza of Punishment, She's not proud of herself, even though she does in her heart believe that it was justice. 
Masandi tells her that the Gascari use crypts. So after agreeing that the bodies need to be dealt with, Danny orders that the bones are returned to their families for proper burials, full well knowing that the widows won't see this as a kindness and curse her all the same. Dario informs her that there are two men awaiting an audience, the first of which is an envoy sent by Astapor's new king, who overthrew the council of wise men she assembled to rule the city. This makes Danny feel ill, which likely didn't improve after she was made aware of the fact that the Yungai are readying for war with her. The Astapori envoy is there to offer the support of Astapor. To seal this alliance, they propose a marriage between her and this new butcher king. She kindly tells him that she will consider his offer and orders that he be given quarters within the pyramid for the evening. Next up was a captain of a Carthine galley who begged an audience to request that he be given leave to buy the freedmen and women who wished to be sold back into slavery. As in most cases, especially in pretty much every city that's not in Slaver's Bay, their lives will be much better than the squalor they're currently living in after being freed from bondage. Danny's shocked by this news, but after learning the truth of it from Dario, she agrees to let them do so, but under the condition that no man can sell his wife or his children. You can only sell yourself. The final order of business that day was what she was dreading the most. The two false Westerosi knights, Jora and Barristan. When they were brought in, she notes that Barristan looked dignified and proud, while Jorah just looked guilty. She decides to deal with Barristan first, and after facing a few harsh truths about her father, Danny forgave him and allowed him to take his rightful place among her Queen's Guard. Jorah's audience didn't go quite as well. He started off by acting like an idiot and lecturing her. So Danny sentenced her exiled knight to yet another round of exile. Doing so hurt her to the point that she couldn't even look at him in the end, knowing that if she did, she'd cry. And if she cried, she'd forgive him, when she knew that she couldn't. That was the final business of court that day, so she returned to her personal apartments and tried to get some rest. It was not to be. The next morning, she summoned her officers to her terrace, to tell them that she had made a decision. Aegon the Conqueror brought fire and blood to Westeros, but afterward he gave them peace, prosperity, and justice. But all I have brought to Slaver's Bay is death and ruin. I have been more call than queen, smashing and plundering, and then moving on. There's nothing to stay for, said Brown Ben Plum. Your Grace, the slavers brought their doom on themselves, said Dario Naharis. You have brought freedom as well, Missande pointed out. Freedom to starve, asked Danny sharply. Freedom to die? Am I a dragon or a harpy? Am I mad? Do I have the taint? A dragon, Sir Barristan said with certainty. Marine is not Westeros, your grace. But... How can I rule seven kingdoms if I cannot rule a single city? He had no answer to that. Danny turned away from them to gaze out over the city once again. My children need time to heal and learn. My dragons need time to grow and test their wings. And I need the same. I will not let this city go the way of Astapor. I will not let the harpy of Young Kai chain up those I've freed all over again. She turned back to look at their faces. I will not march. What will you do then, Khaleesi? asked Ricaro. Stay, she said. Rule and be a queen. So, after a few rough days in Marine, Denny does some reflecting and realizes that while her intentions were noble, her results have been poor, so she summons her captains to inform them that she has decided to stay in Marine. She begins this meeting by speaking openly and honestly about how the results of her actions thus far are not something she's proud of, nor is she willing to let it continue. She explains 
that after Aegon's conquest, he brought peace, prosperity, and justice to the Seven Kingdoms, which contrasts her actions thus far, which was simply conquering and moving on, which was brought in pretty much nothing but death and ruin to Slaver's Bay. By openly and honestly admitting to her mistakes, Danny is displaying a key attribute of someone who's a good leader. She doesn't allow stubbornness or pride to get in her way. She reflects on what she's done, and she's flexible and humble. Also, once she makes up her mind, she's resolute. This is perfectly showcased when all of her men try to convince her to leave Marine and head towards Westeros. Then, when Masande tries to make her feel better by telling her that she brought freedom to Slaver's Bay, Danny almost choked on the word. In her mind, all she's accomplished thus far is she's given people the freedom to starve. In many cases, as she learned here, those she freed are worse off now than they were before. This prompts her to ask her advisors whether they consider her to be a harpy or a dragon, which implies that the former wouldn't blink an eye at the thought of abandoning Marine to a fate such as Astapor's, whereas a dragon would not. Barristan replies that she's a dragon, which seems to mean that a dragon wouldn't abandon her people in their time of need. Seeing that her advisors were not completely sold, she asked them how she would be able to rule the Seven Kingdoms if she couldn't even rule one city, which isn't exactly a perfect analogy, but it did leave them all at a loss for words. So, after carefully and logically bringing them through her line of thinking, there was only one more question that needed answering. And despite all of them not wanting to hear the answer they knew was coming, they asked anyways. What's next? Danny's reply? Stay, rule, and be a queen. <laughs>